Again, it's good to be with you here this morning. Glad to have the opportunity to come and present some lessons with you today and hope these lessons will be encouraging and beneficial to you and uh, inspire you to serve God and uh, be faithful to Him. It's good to see uh, so many people that are familiar with and uh, be back at the congregation I grew up with and uh, brings back uh, a lot of memories to be here, a lot of good memories, and uh, again, I'm glad that we had this opportunity to be with you today. Uh, you may not remember, but 30 years ago, on this very day, uh, we were assembled together. Some of us were. Uh, my wife and I got married 30 years ago today, and uh, I was thinking, what can you do for the 30th anniversary? So I thought, take her to Shebbyville, go to the El Bethel Church of Christ, what's better than that? So uh, glad that we have this opportunity to be here and celebrate our anniversary with you today as well. This morning we're going to be looking in our uh, study at the agony of sin. And we think about the agony of sin, the Bible teaches us that sin brings uh, difficult things in our life. Proverbs 13 and verse 15, the proverb writer says, Good understanding gains favor, but the way of the unfaithful is hard. And this is something that society doesn't teach us. Society teaches us that when you choose to live your life the way that you want to live it, then that's the best thing for you. That's what makes you happiness, and that's when true joy is going to be found. But if the choices that a person is making in their life leads them to do things that are causing them to be unfaithful to God, then they are bringing things that are hard into their life. The Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews 2, verses 1 and 2, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. The Hebrew writer tells us when you look at the old law of God and you think about uh, people who transgressed that law and were disobedient, there was a just reward to that disobedience. God re rewarded that disobedience, not positively. You go back and you read the scriptures and you can see the punishment that God brought upon those individuals because of their disobedience to him. And so we learn from the scriptures that sin does not bring pleasure, sin does not bring joy and happiness, but sin is something that causes agony in our lives. And I would like us to consider some examples of this. Uh, the first example I want us to note is Adam and Eve. And we know that they were in the Garden of Eden. Uh, God placed them there, the very first man and the very first woman. And even though there was no sin in the world at the time, they still had responsibilities to God to tend and keep the garden. And in that process, they were commanded not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But this is something that they were tempted and deceived to do. And following the advice of the serpent, uh, they ate of that fruit and sinned against God. And consequences came as a result of that sin. We will start looking there at Genesis 3 and verse 7. Then the eyes of both were, of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And so we see the consequence of uh, Adam's uh, decision here. He says that I was afraid. When we looked as the serpent promised, your eyes would be open and you would have this knowledge and you will be like God. He didn't experience that. He experienced fear. And when it came to God, he wanted to hide from God. He was ashamed to be in the presence of God at this point. And so he 
foolishly tried to hide from God. You can't hide from God, but this is what Adam tried to do, and Eve as well. And so we look with the first man and the first woman, and we see that in relationship to the agony of sin, that there was mental and emotional suffering uh, from this sin. And this mental and emotional suffering, this fear, and being ashamed to be in the presence of God and wanting to hide from Him, all this happened because Adam and Eve chose to sin. Because they chose to eat of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. This came upon them. But another example we might consider is the example of Cain, just in the next chapter there in Genesis. We talked about Cain's brother this morning, Abel. Abel offered to God a more uh, well-pleasing sacrifice, and because of that, he was rewarded. And Cain, he didn't. Cain offered of the fruit of the ground, and his offering wasn't accepted by God. And he was upset about that. And God asked him, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And so he had the opportunity to do like his brother and worship God by faith and be pleasing to him. But Cain was persistent. Cain was not going to worship God that way. And so he became angry and he slew his brother out of anger. And in Genesis 4 and verse 11, we begin to read... So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. And so God tells Cain that this is your consequences. And then as we look there in verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have drawn me out this day from the face of the ground. It shall be hidden from, I shall be hidden from uh, your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. So Cain hears the consequences of his sin and he understands the hardship that he's brought into his life. The punishment that God is putting on him is more than he can bear. It's difficult. It's hard. Uh, this is something that uh, he knows is going to be uh, cause sorrow in his life. And he says there uh, in verse 14, I shall be hidden from your presence. He felt separated from God. Uh, he felt like that he uh, was not with God anymore. And again, we look at this mental and emotional suffering of Cain and This all happened because of what he did, not because of Adam and Eve or somebody else and what they did. All these things happened to Cain because of what he did in his life. But then we also think about the agony of sin, and we can consider David as an example of sin. David was a man after God's own heart. Uh, David is somebody we're going to be considering this uh, evening in our afternoon sermon And there are many wonderful things that can be said about David. He wasn't perfect, and there was a time in his life when he got up one evening from his residence, and he was walking on the roof, and he could look and see on the roof of a house below him a woman who was taking a bath. And he stood there, and he lusted after that woman, and he sent his men to her house to bring her to him, and he committed adultery. Very shameful thing that David did. And then David went in the process of trying to conceal this. So even though other people know what David did, he thinks he can cover this up. So he brings her husband home from battle, and that plan doesn't go as he wanted, and so he sends him back to battle, and he gives instructions concerning him, uh, put this man in the fiercest part of the fight, and then have all the people pull back from him so he will be killed. So he commits adultery with his wife, and then he has him killed in battle. All this David is doing to conceal that he has been disobedient to God. And David wrote a psalm about this experience in his life. In Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5, David writes, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. 
Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whom spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old, through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave me my, uh, the, forgave the iniquity of my sin. We look, and David talks about this blessing of forgiveness, but that took over a year for him to do that. It took him over a year for him to say, I have sinned and seek the forgiveness of God. And so during that time of the year, we see that David is struggling with what he has done. And he says there in verse 3, When my bones grew old, my groaning all the day long. What David had done affected him emo emotionally. It affected him mentally with suffering. But what David also did affected him other ways. In verse 4 there, he says, Your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the uh, drought of summer. And so he experienced such suffering mentally and emotionally that it began to affect him physically as well. The way he slept, the way he felt, uh, it began to affect him in those ways. And this is something that we see when people go through similar things as well. That there are mental and uh, emotional uh, sufferings that a person goes through, but that can weigh so heavy upon them that it begins to affect their physical health as it is doing with David. His vitality turned into summer as a drought. And we think about why these things happened to David. It's not because of what anybody else had done. These things happened to David because of the choice that he made because the decision he made in his life to be disobedient to God and to sin. Another example we will consider is the example of Judas. And in Matthew chapter 27, we read in verses 1 through 4, When morning had came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. And so at this point, the Garden of Gethsemane has happened. G Judas has gone and betrayed Jesus with a kiss. He's been taken into custody. And now he is about to be tried and, and put to death. And I'm sure that Judas, when he decided to take 30 pieces of silver in order to betray the Lord, had thought, you know, we've been in situations before where... We've been in a town and people have sought to kill the Lord and he's just walked through the crowd and escaped and delivered himself. This is a way that I can get 30 pieces of silver and the Lord is just going to deliver himself and everything's going to be wonderful and fine. Nobody's going to get hurt, but that's not the case. In this case, Jesus is going to be delivered to death and uh, he's going to die. And so at this point, Judas begins to realize uh, what has uh, the consequences of his action. In verse 3, Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. And so again, we see with Judas the emotional and the mental suffering. We see that he was very remorseful for what he did. We see that he acknowledged the fact that he had done something wrong. He had not uh, behaved the way that he should. And this was so severe at that moment that he went out and he hanged himself. And so it affected him, obviously, physically. And again, this is not because somebody is persecuting him and putting so much pressure on him that he is denying the faith. It's faith is not because what anybody else has done. It's because Judas loved money. Judas was greedy. And 30 pieces of silver seemed like a lot to him. And so he was willing to betray the Lord for that. 
And when he realized he did the wrong thing, he tried to correct it. He tried to take that money back and, and they wouldn't take it. It wasn't going to reverse his decision. And so he was so remorseful at that point, he went out and he hanged himself. Judas chose uh, to commit suicide. But all this is a result of the agony of sin. This is a result of the consequence that sin has on an uh, individual. And there are people in our lives today, uh, maybe you yourself have experienced this, that because of decisions that you've made in your life, uh, things have been made hard. And because of that, you suffer emotionally, you suffer mentally from those things, and it may be so severe, it affects your health. You can't sleep, you can't eat, or maybe you have to eat in order to comfort yourself and you overeat. And so there's all these things that people go through because they have chosen to sin. And that's not even all of it. When we think about the agony of sin, it goes beyond that. It goes even into death. As we think about torments and look, look at Luke chapter 16, we read about the rich man and Lazarus, and both of these men died, and the rich man goes to a place called torments, and we see how sin affects him after death. It says in Luke 16 and verse 24, Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime... You receive your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. As we look at after death, we see that the rich man is affected by his sins. He was tormented in the flame. I don't know exactly what that means and, and how that was taking place, but I know what the scripture says, that when he died, as a result of his sins, he was suffering this torment, and he's been suffering those torments. To this day, at this very moment, the rich man wishes that someone would dip the tip of their finger in water and comfort him. He is still in torments to this time. That's what sin does. That's the agony that sin brings in the individual's life. When we look there at verse uh, 25, the rich man says that he is, is tormented. And in verse 26, he doesn't want his brothers to come to that place uh, of torment, uh, that he wants somebody to go back so that they will will not uh, come there to him. And so uh, he's worried and concerned that other people might follow him uh, with the mistakes that he had made. But again, we look at the rich man, and he was uh, affected by this after uh, death. And this is all because of decisions that he made in his life. As we continue on there in Luke 16 and verse 27, it says... Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that, they may, uh, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torments. He didn't want anybody to follow uh, concerning the steps that he had taken. And we think about that place that he is in. Torments is a temporary place. One day, torments is going to be replaced by something permanent, uh, torments is going to be replaced by hell. And in Mark chapter 9, verses 44, 46, and 48, we see that hell is described as a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The idea of a worm comes and eats the body. Eventually, that body is consumed and there's no more food for the worm. That process of decomposing is over. But in hell, that process of decomposing never ends because the worm does not die. The fire is not quenched. Again, we've all seen wood burn. Uh, 
Eventually that wood breaks down to coals and those coals break down to ashes and then the fire goes out. But hell is a place where the fire does not go out because that process of destruction is never going to end. In Matthew 13 and verse 42, Jesus talks about the wicked being cast into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And so those who die and go to torments will eventually spend eternity being in the place where they suffer uh, by wailing and gnashing their teeth. And then in Matthew 25 and verse 46, Jesus says, These will go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. We have no question, we have no doubt, that if a person who is righteous goes to, with God, to be with God in heaven, that eternity means forever, that that will never come to an end. But think, people think about the opposite and they think about the punishment of sin and they say God is too loving that he would punish somebody eternally for something they did. But the text shows us that those who have eternal life, we see that the same word describes those who are going to be punished, that it will be eternal as well. And so we see that when we think about the agony of sin, that it is something that is terrible. To think about things that people go through this, in this life because of the decisions that they make is, is horrible and how this affects other people. But then to think about the fact that this is going to follow them after death and this is going to follow them into eternity even adds to how difficult that would be. And this is a miserable sermon. To sit here and think about how terrible sin is, it's just miserable. And this is just one side of the agony of sin. There is another side concerning the agony of sin. And I want us to think about this side for a while. Because this side of the agony of sin is terrible to think about, but it's the side that gives us hope. Because we all have sinned, we all have fallen short of the glory of God, and we suffer for those sins, but we want to have hope. And so when we think about the other side of the agony of sin, we can have hope from this. It gives us uh, opportunity to overcome our sins. And this side of the agony of sin, I want us to consider Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, the Hebrew writer says, For, uh, who was in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. As we look at these verses, I think these verses paint us an image of Jesus, particularly in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's when we think about Jesus being in prayer and offering up uh, vehement cries and tears and the uh, struggling that Jesus went through. And we see the agony of sin that Jesus uh, experienced in the, the Garden. We see Jesus going through misery. We see Jesus going through the shame of of those things that were coming upon him, being forsaken by his own disciples. We see Jesus experiencing the guilt, not of his own guiltiness, but the guilt that other people had when it comes to their sins and having to do that which was necessary to get them to be able to overcome that guilt. We see the despair that Jesus is in. Let this cup pass from me. You know, if there's another way, if there's another opportunity, you know, let it pass. We see that he feels forsaken. We see that he wonders why God, his Father, has forsaken him. All these difficulties that Jesus went through, and yet, when we think about the agony of sin and the other examples we considered, it was because of choices that they had made, things that they had done. And Jesus had not done those things. Jesus had not sinned. Jesus had not been disobedient to his Father in heaven. He was going through these things 
on our behalf. He was going through these things so that we would be able to overcome our agony of sin. He was willing to experience that himself. As we think about Jesus and the agony of sin, we go back to Matthew 26 when he is in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Matthew chapter 26 there in verse 36, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee. And uh, uh, we continue on there. Uh, he took them and told them to, to wait while he went and he went, uh, prayed. And he wanted them to watch. And then in verse 39, he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. We see the struggle that Jesus uh, went through as he's here in the, the Garden of Gethsemane. How difficult uh, that struggle uh, was for him. How he was suffering and the anguish uh, that he uh, was going through. And it always impresses me that Jesus is God. Jesus knows he is going to be put to death. He knows he's going to overcome death. But this is just a step that he is going to take. But even though he knows he's going to overcome death, it's something he doesn't want to go through. Let this cup pass for me. If there's another way, you know, let it be done. But there isn't another way. This is what he had to do to do his Father's will. This is what he had to do in order for us to be able to overcome our sins. Jesus had to mentally and emotionally go through this suffering. As we continue on there in Matthew 26, we read, then he, say, uh, then he came to the disciples and found them asleep and said to Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Again, we see the struggle that Jesus is going through. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, he knew what he is about to suffer, how terrible uh, that is. And he didn't just pray one time, he prayed two times, and he prayed a third time. And we all have been in difficulty before and probably know the comfort of having close friends, Christians with us during those difficult times. Imagine going through that difficulty and those people can't even stay awake, that they're falling asleep on you, that they're not there to support you. And this is what Jesus is finding when he goes back with those four disciples, that they are so tired and weary that they are sleeping, and he's going through this emotional and mental suffering himself. But as we go to other uh, passages of Scripture there, Matthew 26, we see in verse 45, he came to his disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus knows that he is about to be given to sinners, and sinners are going to have their way with him. They are, are going to cause him to go through a lot of suffering. As we turn over to Psalm 22, we see the psalmist speaking of this suffering that is to come. In verse 12, many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like uh, wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to this dust of death. When we look, the psalmist is talking about the things that Jesus would experience on the cross. 
and how this was not just mental and emotional, but this goes to the physical realm. This goes to the things that he uh, experienced as far as suffering is concerned. As we go on there in Psalm 22, in verse 16, it says, For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the uh, wicked has enclosed uh, me, they pierce my hands and my feet, I can count all my bones, they look and stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lot. All these physical things happening to Jesus, the suffering that he's going through, and how people are just treating him like property, treating him as he is not human, that uh, inhumanely. Again, Jesus suffered these things on our behalf. In Isaiah 53, this is brought out very clearly to us, beginning at verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When we look, Isaiah very clearly shows the suffering Jesus went through on our behalf. What we have done that caused him to go through those things and how he did that for us. When we think about the agony of sin, this is the other side of the agony of sin. But this is a side where we get hope. And we want to go back to Hebrews at this time to think about the passage we uh, began our lesson with. Because of Jesus, we do not have to experience the full agony of sin. Let's remember Hebrews 5, verses 7 and 8. Who in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. It's not that Jesus didn't know how to obey, but he experienced obedience through suffering on this, uh, in this occasion. And he did this again for our sake, for our behalf. In verse 9 it says, And he has been having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. As we think about Jesus, he is the author of salvation. Because of who he is and because of his death, burial, and resurrection, his obedience to his father in those things, and the way that he suffered, he has made salvation available to us. But it's only available to us when we are obedient to him. As we think about how sin makes our lives difficult and hard, you may be here this morning as somebody that's being emotionally affected by that. You may be someone here this morning that is being mentally affected by decisions that you have made in your life when you have been disobedient to God. Those are things that can be undone to some extent. You can be forgiven and you know that those sins have been taken away just like David. David went through those things but he realized blessed is the person whose sins God has forgiven. And so when he sought forgiveness from God, he felt that blessing. But if you're here and you know you have those sins in your life, what we need to be concerned about is the torments and hell that is to come. Those are things that we can 100% be delivered from. And we can be delivered from them because of what Jesus has done for us. And so considering him as the author of our salvation, this morning why not give yourself the hope of overcoming the agony of sin and give yourself the assurance that you do not have to have the agony of sin after death and have the agony of sin eternally. Be obedient to our Lord. Through our, your obedience, He can deliver you. If you're here this morning and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you believe the gospel message that He has brought, that you have sinned and fallen short of doing His will, and you want to be forgiven, 
If you're willing to repent of those sins and turn from them, confess your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and then be baptized into His death, you can have your sins washed away and find relief from the agony of sin. Jesus was willing to suffer the things that He did that you might have this hope. And so if you're here this morning and are willing to be obedient, you can be blessed this morning by being delivered from the agony of sin. We ask you to come forward as we stand and sing.